My name is Jerry Gill, and I'm interviewing David Peters. Uh, today is July 28th, 2008, and we're in the Edmund Law Library at the OSU Stillwater campus. Uh, I'm a faculty member of the Oklahoma State University Library, and this interview is being conducted as part of the O State uh, Storage Project of the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program. Uh, David, uh, can you share with us a little bit about your Oklahoma State University connections and your OSU family background? Uh, I came to Stillwater uh, because my father was uh, hired as department head in the demolition department in 1971. Uh, I didn't want to come here. It was the second half of my junior year in high school, and uh, I had gone from kindergarten through my junior year at Ames, Iowa, and uh, my father had been a faculty member at Iowa State, uh, but they drugged me kicking and screaming to Stillwater to finish up my high school career uh, here. and. Uh, uh, ended up staying for now over 37 years. Uh, I've escaped several times, but uh, my father was a faculty member and that's why I first came here. Uh, my first visits to campus were as a, a faculty brat. Well, could you kind of fill in a little bit there? I know you work with OSU Library. Now, could you tell us a little bit about your other connections with OSU leading up to your present position? And if you could uh, tell us a little bit maybe how long you worked with the library. Okay. Um, after, after high school, I started my freshman year at Tabor College in Hillsboro, Kansas. Um, but I had a, a young lady that I'd met in high school uh, and uh, came back uh, to OSU uh, and uh, then started my sophomore year here. Uh, joined Delta Tau Delta Fraternity, uh, did my undergraduate work here. Um, lived at the Methodist Student Center for a while because uh, um, it, it took an extra year for me to graduate or complete my requirements. And um, so undergraduate work here, joined the Peace Corps, uh, lived in West Africa for about two and a half years, uh, came back, uh, then did some training work with Peace Corps, and so went to South Carolina for a short time, came back again, started graduate school in history, uh, worked with the uh, OSU Centennial History Project, mm -hmm. um, and ended up being a co-author of uh, the campus book talked about the development of the facilities on campus. I mm -hmm. uh, worked with Louis Sanderson and Dean McGlamory. Uh, Louis and Dean had been here since the 20s, <laughs> a long time, um, but they had me do the, the first roughly 35 years of the campus from 1890 to about 1928 when President Bennett arrived. I mm -hmm. uh, started off just doing the research for that, um, and then uh, Louis asked me if I'd be willing to write that section, so I ended up writing those first five chapters. Uh, and for my master's work, uh, all but thesis, all my coursework, I believe, was completed, but I never finished the thesis. I started working with the Centennial History Project, and then I got the job here in Special Collections at the OSU Library. Uh, did that for five or six years. Um, then an opportunity to work in the OSU Map Room. Uh, worked, worked down in the Map Room then for about seven or eight years, uh, and then came back up to Special Collections, and I've been in Special Collections since, uh, it was about December of 2000. So uh, that's kind of my career uh, and relationship with OSU. Uh, while I was in the map room, uh, I did complete my GIS certificate, Geographic Information Systems certificate through the OSU Geography Department and was working with, uh, my interest was mapping of buildings on campus. So facilities that are no longer here, trying to figure out where they were and utilizing old maps and then scanning that information in, creating digital files and trying to figure out spatial relationships to existing facilities. So, anyway. What a, what a fascinating background, David. Uh, you, you, uh, you mentioned uh, uh, up to 1928, the Bennett. I think, uh, as I recall, you referred to three eras in the past of OSU history. Could you, you know, in relation to Henry G. Bennett, President Henry G. Bennett, could you maybe expand on that a bit? Okay. Um, with my experience with the campus book, uh, I was often asked to lead tours of a variety of different groups of people. And really, I, I'd kind of try to keep it simple, um, but I think it may be uh, appropriate. I, I define three periods of campus development, pre-Bennett, Bennett, Bennett, and post-Bennett. Uh, the pre-Bennett era is defined in, in, in my scheme, those buildings that are centered around Old Central. If they face in towards Old Central or face towards the South, and that old original quadrangle, mm -hmm. um, that's the pre-Bennett era. Uh, it's a much smaller scale, it's more eclectic architecture, um, and uh, it really defines a period from about 1891 to 1928, 
President Bennett arrives in 1928 uh, as president for over 22, 23 years. Um, he changes the scale and, and the, the center of campus. Uh, he creates a new center of campus, not based on Old Central, but what would become the Edmund Lowe Library. Um, and, and quadrangles built around what would become the library as we know it today. Um, the scale of the buildings is much larger. Uh, there's, it's referred to as modified Georgian, Phillips, Wilbur, whatever, but it's, it's, a, it's a more um, uh, symmetrical, uh, more common styles of angles of roofs, uh, certain brick structures, OSU brick blend is what they call them, the brick now in fact. Um, but that's, that's, a, that's a new center of campus at the library. Post Bennett, which begins really after, after Willem, uh, President uh, Willem came in after, after Bennett had died in the crash uh, with his wife and other members of the OSU community, but Willem kind of continues the Bennett legacy um, until about, well, the 60s. And then after the 60s, especially with uh, about 1964, 65, I call it the, the, the post Bennett era. Um, Sometimes it's hard to tell where the front of the building is. Uh, they're not necessarily faced towards anything. So you have you have really a lot of the auxiliary enterprises, uh, the Colvin Center, um, just the, the residence halls, um, high rise. Uh, there's a variety of different architectural styles. They tried to blend some of the things in with the brick, but the styles of the buildings are different. Um, the roof lines, those kinds of things. Um, and so that's kind of the the, the post uh, Bennett era. Um, and I, I, uh, and actually, I think we're entering a new phase now, and, and I've talked to some people about this, uh, kind of a fourth phase. And right now, for simplicity, I'm calling it Boone. Uh, it's, it's, it's mm -hmm. the expansion north. We've always moved to the north and the northwest. And so that, that, that continues on, that, that growth of the campus. Um, but with the, the large investment by Mr. Pickens, um, you know, in the athletic development area north of campus, um, so really, I think we're entering kind of a new phase, and, and just for simplicity, I call it I call it Boone. What, uh, uh, as you mentioned, you've authored, uh, uh, co-authored some books on you know, buildings in the Ocean Campus, and uh, these have been published, and so you, you probably uh, are as knowledgeable as anyone on the campus about those. So if I could follow up a couple of questions, Dave, and maybe in your comments, uh, have you, you know, first of all, question, have you agreed with the, uh, raising of some of the, the old buildings of the past, for example, Williams Hall, some others. Uh, your thoughts? Uh, your... Um, some of these buildings, well, some of our, our permanent buildings lasted less, had a shorter duration than some of our temporary buildings. Um, Williams Hall, I don't know of anyone who's pleased that we, we destroyed Williams Hall. The reality was the building was built in, in at least four phases. There were two main phases and they added on uh, the architect was from Belgium, uh, Joseph Foucault, and he really hadn't uh, allowed for the, the movement within our clay soils. And so the foundations of many of our early buildings were suspect. We've always had continuing problems with Old Central. We've tried to, mm -hmm. and we're, we're in, in that right now, we're trying to refortify and restructure kind of to keep that building alive. Um, I think Williams Hall could have been saved. Uh, one of the problems is we've never really had adequate resources to maintain many of our early facilities. And so since they were, they were built on, on foundations that weren't prepared for our soils and then we didn't have the funds to adequately maintain them over time, um, economics told us it was going to be cheaper to, to tear down and start new. Um, we, we preserved a few things. Uh, Morrill Hall, Old Central are both pre-statehood uh, uh, buildings, uh, so from the last two buildings from the territorial period. Uh, the Bartlett Center for the Studio Arts uh, has been uh, uh, maintained. Um, uh, the gymnasium that was built at the time of World War I um, yeah, is now being renovated uh, for architecture and putting additions onto it. Um, but Williams, it, it's just uh, it's a shame. I mean, I, I wish we could have been able to preserve it. It would have taken enormous sums of money the state simply didn't have at the time, and the university didn't have at the time. Um, but I, I don't know of anyone who's pleased that we had to tear it down. Um, uh, David, speaking of the, the new plan, does it call for uh, uh, taking down uh, uh, Thatcher Hall, I think, in, in, in uh, uh, what's it, the uh, other hall? 
Hainer. Uh, yeah, Hainer. Um, I, I have been privy to the discussions, but I've, I've heard uh, from some of my contacts in various departments that uh, Hainer and Thatcher are probably not going to be with us much longer. Um, that that uh, they were they were dormitories built in the 1927s, uh, 1927, 28, um, and uh, just uh, structurally. Their, their lifespan is about over. Uh, they've got about 80 years under their belts. and, and uh, Those are both historically significant in terms of the names, the individuals from their names. Right. Carter uh, Henry's first graduate to be killed in World War I. Uh, he was a Stillwater uh, OS, OAMC uh, mm -hmm. student, uh, the first to die, uh, I believe, in, in battle-related injuries. We had others who died of pneumonia, which was common. Um, but I think he was the first to die of battle-related injuries during World War I. Yes. And then Jesse Thatcher, uh, was the first woman graduate, class of 1897, uh, and later married uh, uh, Mr. Bost. Um, so. Dave, you, you talked earlier about the fourth, fourth phase, you know, whether it's the boom phase or mm -hmm. whatever, but uh, there's a lot of excitement, a lot of buzz around our campus master plan 2025. And what do you like about that plan? What are some things that's, that stand out in your mind? What do I like about the plan? Well, I think, I think you, you have to have a planning structure. Um, and so I, I like the fact that they're thinking forward. They're trying to project um, uh, what the campus needs are going to be over the next 20, 25 years. It's, it's the same principle that, that Dr. Bennett had tried to do is let's, let's see where we are, but let's project where we think we want to be and then try to, try to figure out a way of getting there. And so um, I, I like that planning process. If you look at the original Bennett plan and then what actually happened, it changed during, during the intervening years. And I, I think that the current plan will probably change as, as funds become available or priorities alter. Um, um, but I do like, uh, at one point, there was an attempt to try to bring the colleges together in kind of, in kind of areas or, or, or clusters. Um, um, I, like, I like that concept, um, but I also like that they were trying to um, have more, by the simple spatial relationship of things, try to encourage interdisciplinary activities too, uh, and, I, and I like that also. Um, it, will, it will greatly expand uh, the facilities uh, and, the, and the centralization of the facilities in, in the athletics, uh, in that in the athletic department. Um, parking has always been a problem, and uh, there are uh, uh, several facilities designed for improved parking uh, in the future, and I, I think, um, well, it depends upon how gas prices go in the future, but uh, I think parking will continue to be a problem. And I know they're trying to preserve green areas, which I think is also uh, important on a college campus to have lawns um, and, and to provide places where people can just be, um, and, and whether it's under under trees or by Theta Pond or whatever, but trying to preserve those lawn areas, uh, I think is, is critical. And, and so by doing that though, you have to move parking and provide, you know, um, uh, one of the things I'm not quite sure of, and, and there again, I'm not, I'm not privy to all the details is is how you move things around. If you don't have parking and roads in the center part of campus, how do you get things where they need to be? Like in the library, we're in the middle. Okay, what if we had a shipment of things in? How do we how do we get them to here? Uh, how do we get our people here? Um, but I'm, I'm sure they can come up with a way of doing that. David, fortunately, you're young enough, you know, that you'll probably need to come back in about 15 years or 20 years without a sequel to your book. For all the expansion, there's what? Somewhere, I hear different figures, it's somewhere between 600, 700, 800 million dollars worth of renovation and new construction proposed or projected right. over the next 15, 20 years, something like that. And, and much of that is going to be increased uh, research and laboratory facilities, mm -hmm. um, which I think is going to be important, especially uh, in, in the sciences. Um, increased classroom and, and different types of classrooms. You know, the classroom today is different than the classroom of, of even 25, 30 years ago. Um, and, you know, and so, um, I don't know if I'm young enough, but but <laughs> but I do look forward to coming back, or, or at least being on campus uh, still. Um, but yeah, it, it's going to change. Um, and, uh, Dave, kind of getting back to the historical perspective, what uh, what area in OSU history is, is particularly fascinating? Do you sense that in your mind? Well, I mean, um, a certain area you just like or you enjoy. I, more. I like the pre-Bennett period myself. Mm -hmm. um, I, mean, I think Bennett was a remarkable fellow, and, and I, I, I uh, admire the way he was able to, to work with others and, and, and develop the campus in a, in a plan. 
but uh, I kind of like the eclectic uh, nature of the early campus. Uh, it was a smaller institution. Um, uh, mostly, uh, most of our students were coming from rural backgrounds. This is when Oklahoma was probably rural. Our populations were, were still living, coming in from the homesteads. And, and uh, I, I really like that period uh, before 1928. Um, I mean, they, they, uh, they struggled through the pioneer phase of development, uh, uh, trying to figure out how to, what to grow, what, what livestock to raise. Um, uh, and you had uh, young men and women uh, coming to OSU to learn practical skills that they were going to take back to their home communities, whether it's going to be teachers or farmers or, or, or engineers for, for uh, you know, building the infrastructure that this, the territory needed to become a state. Um, uh, statehood, the excitement of statehood, you know, we're celebrating our 100th mm -hmm. anniversary, but, um, you know, to, to, we're such a new state. Uh, and so to think, you know, 1907, uh, you know, we're, we're becoming a state. Uh, we get through the um, uh, World War One, uh, and, and really, you know, U.S. involvement came towards the end of World War One. But but we had a number of, of uh, training programs. The Student Army Training Corps was here, and, and uh, a number of our uh, students who served in World War One. Um, uh, the twenties is an exciting time. You know, we're we're starting to kind of get our adolescence as a state and as an institution. Um, but we're still we're still relatively small, uh, mostly attracting students from from Oklahoma. Uh, um, you know, I guess I like that period because it's before the depression hits. I mean, we get the depression and the dust bowl, and boy, the struggle really comes on again, uh, and it's tough. But before twenty eight, um, also I admire people like uh, Ed Gallagher, uh, who was a, a student, former student here. Uh, but we had a number of, of marvelous uh, presidents. Angelo Scott uh, was a I think one of our best presidents early on, and uh, I, just, I just like that period. It's, it's a little further back in time. And I guess just the, the story and the history of the founding of how we got located in the land grant college, mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's still worth quite a story too. And it's a, right. right. Well, I mean, you know, you, you've got this new territory, and, and we're just actually representing you know, Oklahoma territory, not really Indian territory so much. So we're and we have all these new folks coming in here, and, and so you know, Stillwater leaders are trying to figure out, well, what do we want? You know, do we want the want the state penitentiary? We want the state mental hospital? We want the capital? Do we want the, the land grant college? You know, what do we want? You know, and, and they finally settle on the on the land grant college, and then, you know, they do get Payne County declared as a site, but then they got to get Stillwater within Payne County declared as a site, and kind of the. They, they kind of worked the system a little bit and, and made sure that uh, uh, Stillwater ter territorial legislature politics, right? <laughs> legislature politics, and <laughs> luckily there was an even even match of, of Republicans and Democrats, and and our guy Garden Hire was kind of a, a third party, and he decided which which way the vote went, and so he kind of had more pull than he probably should have had, and, and uh, so we end up with the with the college and the experiment station. I mean, I think sometimes we forget the experiment station was really as much of a draw as anything because we had all these. Uh, new farmers um, and the experiment station provided the, the research and, and the extension programs in. We, we tried this, it grew well, try it. You know, we think, we think it has a chance of, of going. And the federal funding that went with those programs. Federal Local funding that went with it. Stillwater leaders realized that, didn't they? Funding right. that come from the legislature, but also federal funding. Well, right, right. In fact, we were really, our first buildings were temporary buildings, they were wood frame buildings, but they came from uh, federal funds, from Hatch Act funds mm -hmm. that could be used for the experiment station. Right. So. Well, uh, you're talking about being our, our rural heritage and kind of roots. Uh, what do you, uh, uh, you know, what do you feel are always use of strongest institutional values and kind of our enduring uh, legacy uh, and, uh, and traditions? You, you studied it quite a bit. Uh, any thoughts on that? Well, um, I, I have thought about it some. Uh, I think that generally speaking, uh, Oklahomans are fairly self-reliant folk, um, and uh, they're going to they're going to figure out a way to do it. Um, and they really have trouble, I think, asking for help sometimes because they think they can do it themselves. But I think also uh, OSU and in, in Oklahoma um, people are fairly good at recognizing when somebody else needs help, and so rather than wait for that person to ask, they volunteer. Um, and so what I've kind of seen over time, and, and, 
And OSU was really built for providing practical skills and knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, you know, we have pulled ourselves up by the bootstrap and, and, and figured out how to make things work. And when people couldn't, there's usually been someone there who reached their hand out to them um, to help them along. Um, and so there's kind of that, there's the independence part of it, but there's also a network part of it. Uh, and I think, uh, generally speaking, we're, at least I hope we are, we're, we're good at seeing the need around us and help bring other people up with us. Uh, and I think that's a rural, I think it's a rural thing. You know, when you're out there on 160 acres in, in Major County, and your nearest neighbor is a quarter mile, half mile away, and you know, and you need something, and and it's it's you know, and you know they're in the same situation you are. Um, um, it, it, it creates a, a bond, I think, between people, and they know when to reach out and when to let somebody be alone. Um, 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 what what um, I guess what concerns me a little bit is you know for the first roughly 60 years of our existence, we were part of a segregated state and a segregated institution. And so I think what we've tried to do in the last 50 years is expand our perspective on, there's a bigger population, there's a population that's been here a long time and we need to reach out to everyone. Um, and so um, our inclusion of, of black Americans, uh, more Hispanic uh, Americans from those backgrounds, um, Native Americans, um, you know, international. international students. Uh, and so um, hopefully we're beginning to expand our, our smaller community and to include other communities and realize that people, even though they may be defined as in different groups, we're all part of really the same state, the same community. Um, and hopefully we can learn to reach out. David, what uh, have you had a chance in your studies to think about uh, who in your mind, two, three, four, five, individual that had the most significant influence on Oklahoma State in history and development. Henry Bennett okay. would have to be the first. Mm -hmm. um, uh, long duration as president, uh, had had the skills to work with almost anybody. Um, and uh, whether it was having to work with the, with the legislators or, or the governors, mm -hmm. uh, to work with the Chamber of Commerce, to work with the uh, uh, Contractors, builders, whatever it is, to work, to work with faculty, to to interact with students, uh, to have good relationships with his staff. I mean, this man could work with anybody, um, and uh, and he'd find a way to, to to make progress. He had a plan, and he'd figure out who he needed to work with. But if somebody else had something else they were doing, he'd work with them on that too. It just just a remarkable personality, um, and. Uh, the room we're in right now was actually designed for him. It was going to be his hideaway uh, when uh, he was president. Uh, it was going to be a place where he could come to kind of get away from all the hustle and bustle, or he could he could entertain someone here if he needed to talk with someone about something. They could come to a quiet spot where they could they could talk. Uh, of course, the building wasn't completed until after his death. But uh, Henry Bennett is is number one. Um, uh, I mentioned Ed Gallagher. Mm -hmm. uh, Long time uh, a coach, uh, athletic director, um, remarkable gentleman. Uh, first really outstanding athlete. First outstanding athlete. Uh, he ran track, played football, never wrestled as an as a undergraduate, uh, was an engineering student, um, uh, was hired uh, here to work in, in physical education uh, after, after he graduated. I was here for three or four years, went to Kansas. Uh, Baker, he's at Baker University in Baldwin, Kansas. I think that's right. Anyway, for a couple of years as athletic director there, then came back here um, and uh, uh, started off coaching mostly track, but he was looking for a sport where uh, young men, no matter what their size, could, could compete in. Um, and so uh, he had found, he found wrestling um, as, as he thought would be an appropriate sport between the, the fall football season and the spring track season well, during the winter they could they could wrestle mm -hmm. um, and and really developed uh, as a as a coach from scratch I mean he studied uh, uh, engineering principles with leverage and and, uh, and movement with momentum and and, uh, and anatomy he worked with the, the college uh, 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 anatomy biology uh, professor 
uh, on, on the structure of the muscles and, and the, the bones and, and um, develop wrestling. Uh, he hired Mr. Ivan, didn't he? Also the yes, uh, he, as athletic director, he hired uh, um, uh, Henry, Henry, Henry Ivan. Um, and uh, um, then he stepped down as athletic director. Um, oh, uh, what was the coach's name? Uh, he was here, and then he went to K State. Ended up in I've drawn a blank on on uh, Pappy Waldorf. He hired uh, Waldorf to come in, and and when um, this was in the early '30s, and they were having trouble keeping Waldorf here because our salaries were so low. And uh, I think this may have been the time when um, uh, Alfalfa Bill Murray had kind of kind of slashed our budget. Um, and so to keep Waldorf here, uh, Gallagher, who had been athletic director, stepped down from that role and let uh, Pappy Waldorf take over that position to increase his salary, to keep him for another year or two. You know, so be willing to give up part of your job, you know, during a tough time to, to keep somebody here who we thought was an excellent coach. Uh, and then after Waldorf left, I think that's when Iva became uh, athletic director after that. Uh, but it was. Um, um, just a marvelous individual. Uh, I mean, he was he was a, a coach, but he was he was a teacher, uh, and uh, he was taking rural farm boys and, and and boy, if they stuck with with uh, Gallagher for a couple of years, they'd travel around the country and go into go into meets. And, and a number of his uh, wrestlers, you know, were in, in the Olympics, served uh, as U.S. representatives to the Olympics, and, and uh, um, never yelled at the boys. Uh, always had his arm around them when they started the match. And, and when they got through, whether they won or lost, he put his arm around him and walked him off, you know, and, and uh, just, just a, uh, I think, a remarkable individual. Uh, Angelo Scott, I think, was another amazing president. Um, uh, then Bradford Knapp, uh, he came in right after a time of turmoil. We had a bit of a political brouhaha in about 1923, and, and Knapp came in and provided some stability and, and consistency and kind of re retooled us, and emphasized academics and our mission of extension. So uh, those are the kind of folks that I, I admire. David, and your research, though, she had many, uh, uh, many uh, unexpected things you've discovered about OSU, uh, any surprises? And, I mean, no, no, good or bad. <laughs> Survaha experiences. Uh, surprises. Oh, there's, there's, there's kind of quirky little things. Uh, Bennett was having trouble getting funding for things quite frequently, but he had gotten funding for Murray Hall, but he couldn't get funding to to build another residence hall, um, but he could get funding for an addition to an existing uh, building. And so there's a little walkway between Murray and North Murray. And so that little walkway makes North Murray an addition. And so, you know, he was able to get his building, North Murray was then built as a residence hall, but it's an addition to an existing building. Well, the only, makes, the only reason it makes an addition is that little walkway there. Uh, um, it's just uh, the Serotine Center. I'd never realized the Serotine Center was uh, really a part of the old auditorium. It was built around the old auditorium. Um, and so the original auditorium had a, had a, a horseshoe-shaped balcony mm -hmm. on the second floor and then the flat first floor. Uh, well, they took all that out and changed the, the the structure of, of the main auditorium, but that's the same auditorium as the original auditorium that was built in 1910, 1911. Uh, so those kind of tweakings, uh, modifications of things, uh, I've always uh, kind of enjoyed discovering. The uh, the columns from the, the science or chemistry building, it's now the Paul Miller Jerusalem Broadcasting Building, but the original columns, much like uh, uh, Morrill Hall had columns, and you know, none of our early structures had, had columns, um, those columns are still there. They're just inside a utility room now, um, and so you can't see them. But there's there's uh, two or three floors high with the columns in, the, in that, in that um, uh, Theta Pond, of course, uh, was uh, the catchment area from the college horse barn, uh, and so it was it was to catch the runoff uh, from from the barn. Uh, Stewart got her all interesting story too, didn't it? Well, it was, it was, he, there again, I uh, couldn't get, uh, this is President Bennett, couldn't get funding for um, a new gymnasium or, or, or convention center or whatever. Um, 
but each year, 4-H students from around the state would gather in Stillwater uh, in the summers, and they would need a large place to meet. And they would set up tents and, and try to uh, accommodate these large numbers, but they really didn't have an adequate place. And so Bennett's able to, to get the legislature to approve a 4-H convention center uh, on campus, uh, and in part because there had been a, a rather tragic incident in Texas uh, in the previous couple of years in which a group of, of uh, 4-H uh, had gathered, 4-H students had gathered, and there'd been a fire or something and, and lives were lost. And, and so um, men said, we don't want something similar to that. And, and we're set up for something similar to that unless we do something about it. And so uh, the territory, I mean, uh, the state the state legislature then approves funding for the 4-H Convention Center, um, which was completed uh, uh, 1938-39. Um, but it was dedicated February 1939 uh, uh, to Ed Gallagher. Uh, and, and even though in the old building you could still see the um, uh, 4-H, uh, it, was in, it was in the building, um, but everyone who would get this Gallagher Hall, no one ever called it the 4-H convention building. Uh, so, and now it's all been, you know, the, there's a new shell that around it for the Gallagher Ivor Arena. You know, it's interesting, you know, Gallagher Hall uh, was named for Ed Gallagher, but the, the, the where architecture is located, that gymnasium is where 95% of his career took place in that, in that smaller gym, uh, and that was built after he became athletic director. Um, when he came here back back here in 1915, it was built about 1918. Um, um, but that's where you know that's where his career really took place. Uh, Gallagher Hall, which was named for him, is where Iva's career took place, uh, and Henry Iva is the one then who. Who utilized that facility? Uh, it's appropriate that his name was added to it. Too. Yeah, it's appropriate that his name was added to it. Uh, another little thing, like well, even the gymnasium, uh, when the, that first one uh, that was built in 1918, 1919, um, they started construction right, right, well, in the midst of World War One. Well, by the time they got to the point where they needed steel, there wasn't steel available. Um, so at the front, at the center, it says gymnasium, but then the one wing it says armory. Well, and they said, well, it's, it's a gymnasium and armory. Well, once, I think, once they got declared an armory, well, then they got steel because you had to have training, you know, for, for these guys. So, uh, uh, so then they got their steel uh, and were able to finish the building. Um, uh, and that building is the reason why Lewis Field, which used to run north and south, which sat just kind of north and east of that, of that gymnasium building, uh, when they built it, they really didn't have the space there to continue Lewis Field where it was. That's where they moved it to its present location, which is part of the Boone Pickens Stadium. Yeah, further north and further the north and further east and west. Um, so, uh, uh, just those kinds of things. You, know, you, you find out one thing, and that leads. Well, that's why they did that, and that's why they moved over there. And sometimes the puzzle pieces start fitting together then. But uh, David, kind of looking at what you do currently in special collections and work there. Uh, yeah, I mean, just your thoughts on what's the appropriate role and purpose of the library special collections and the university archives. Uh, do you see you know, new uh, opportunities for utilizing it in, in the future as well? Well, I think the critical thing is trying to preserve as much as we can of, of people's experiences. Um, and so we're the, we're the official depository for the university for academic and administrative um, functions that take place. So meeting minutes and correspondence and those kinds of things. Um, but I think we're also really the, the storehouse for uh, individual and, and group experiences. Mm -hmm. So whether it be a, a person's experience as an undergraduate or graduate student or faculty, staff, even visitors oftentimes to campus have, have experiences that they, they, they want to share about the campus, people they met here. Um, but then also the groups, uh, the fraternities and sororities, the service groups, the, uh, the activities that take place here that people have been a part of, whether it's uh, um, flying farmers or, or whatever, uh, PEO, the Red Red Rose was a, an organization that, that Bennett had kind of brought with him. Uh, but there's, there's, there's a, a, a sense of belonging to these individual groups uh, and trying to preserve that too, uh, I think is kind of critical. And so, first of all, trying to collect that information. Uh, oftentimes people say, well, we, we gave that to OSU. Well, they may have given it to a department, they may have given it to the athletic department, they may have given it to the foundation, alumni association and trying to figure out where those things are and make sure we have a, um, access to them or at least, oh, well, we know where that is and, and um, we're try to make sure it's preserved and uh, maintained. But then also, w once we have that material, uh, 
Um, I think really our mission should be to make that information available to others. And so we're, we're kind of at the very beginning of a new, new phase of, of transferring that information to other formats, whether it's on the internet with, with, with scanning images and putting them in digital formats and making them available for people to view, um, uh, correspondence, uh, video, wh whatever it is, moving those things into other formats that then are available for people to see. David, is it fair to say that, in your opinion, is, is the library, libraries generally, and say the OSU library and their collections areas, are they move more from a static kind of collection of, of an archival material to, to presentations, displays, making it more publicly available uh, for researchers, but it's the general public as well? I think that's a, a trend that's going on with libraries, is, is um, uh, we have limited resources, um, and as more and more of the material that's out there is available in electronic formats, we don't have to actually purchase that magazine anymore. We have to purchase a subscription to it. Um, and just as our students are now used to looking at a magazine in a, in a, in a prescription that, I mean, a subscription that, that's online, mm -hmm. um, they want to have our, our collections available in those same kinds of formats that they can, they can, they can do a, a Google search on and it's gonna bring up you know, what we have. And I think in the past, about, and our concern to protect these inf these materials because we, we want to preserve them for the future. You didn't want them handled a lot. You, you didn't want them available and out on the shelf. And so you, you protected them. Well, now we, we've got to get, um, we can have, really have the best of both worlds. We can protect it and yet still make it available. You know, if we convert that to another format that then people can look at on, on screen. Um, and so uh, I think that's the transition. It's, it's um, not just protecting the information for future, but sharing the information in the future. And, and there's a whole series of challenges with that. Um, new file formats. You know, if we save things, if we'd save things onto 8-track, um, not many people have 8-track players anymore. And so we always have to be mindful of the fact that these technologies change. And so any file formats or whatever we set up now, we have to make sure that that's going to be flexible to change to what people are going to be looking at in new five, 10 years, new technology. Um, so making it available, you can't just make it available once you may have to make it available in different formats over time. As long as it's flexible, you'll, you'll be okay. David, is, is archiving and use of oral histories, is that one of, do you think, one of the emerging opportunities available uh, for special collections areas? I think so. Um, and uh, I think the sooner we can get, get that uh, going on an active way, and I know we've, we've had several years now of beginning that experience, um, but uh, with each generation, uh, you know, we're losing those experiences as a people. And whether um, uh, 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 Kenny Gallagher, Ed Gallagher's son, uh, has died within the last few years, I, w I wish I had a chance to talk with him. You know, Louis Sanderson. Louis Sanderson. I, wor I worked with Louis for, for probably three or four years and just kind of took for granted that Louis was always going to be here. Well, Louis's not here anymore. Um, uh, Dean McGlamory also has passed on. Uh, and so. So the two gentlemen I worked with on that book, you know, now I've got so many questions that I, why didn't I ask them? You know, why, why didn't I ask when I had the time? You know, we've gone through that with um, uh, World War I vets. There's, I don't know if there's any left, there maybe one or two. You know, we still have a number of World War II vets, but those numbers are, are decreasing uh, quite rapidly. But we have, we have people from the OSU experience, people that worked in extension, you know, during the Depression. We've had a Dust Bowl project here in Special Collections where we tried to collect the experiences of women during the Dust Bowl. You know, there's, there's groups of people that we still haven't reached, and many of those groups, are, are their numbers are declining rapidly. And so there's a way to try to reach them and, and retain their experiences, retain their knowledge. Um, I think it's critical. So. David, is those stories some way more compelling when you can see someone on, you know, on camera and, and telling their personal reminiscences and stories about those, you know, those events? Yeah, when you when you see a face, and whether it's a twinkle in their eye or a tear in their eye, I mean, you can tell they are the, those memories are so strong for them, and, and 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 then you begin to feel that. I mean, you you, ne you don't necessarily experience what they experience, but you, you begin to feel, wow, that was something. You know that that was that made a that made a mark on them, um, and uh, that's what the human experience is all about is, is is those kinds of experiences, and then being able to share them. You know, and so many of these people have. It may have shared a moment with their family, but but the, you know they're looking for a chance or an opportunity to, to share it with. You know, I'm, 
and oftentimes they're, they're very humble about it. Well, I was just a, I was just a dirt farmer out there in Major County, or whatever. But uh, but they lived through a very dramatic situation and survived and uh, thrived often and uh, overcome it. Uh, so. David, appreciate you taking time to be with us today. It's obvious your passion for OSU and your background. But is there anything that we've left out that you'd like to comment on or in the subject we talked about we didn't ask that uh, they've got to add to the, our collective history here? Hmm. I have, to, I have to schedule a second interview, All Jerry. Right. I'm not sure if anything right, off, right offhand. All right. With that, we'll conclude our interview with David Peters. Thank you, David. Thank you, Jerry.